Hello, welcome to the Monday, March 18th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from, well, an undisclosed location that uh, you have to guess in order to win this month's uh, Raspberry Pi. As far as diaries go, we do have one by Remco showing how Jupyter Notebooks can be integrated with Radari to in order to help you with your reverse analysis and extracting indicators of compromise. The nice thing about these Jupyter Notebooks is that they do allow you to essentially write sort of scripts that combine various other scripting languages like Python, R and such. So uh, this makes them fairly easy sort of wrappers around a number of different tools, like in this case, Radari. So if you're interested in this, uh, take a look at Remco's post. And Proofpoint has an interesting report where they took a look at IMAP brute forcing against some of the major cloud providers like Outlook 365 and uh, Google. The reason that IMAP is such an attractive target is that multi-factor authentication usually doesn't work well to protect IMAP accounts. Your mail client constantly has to log in and check whether there's any new email available for you. So having to enter a token or anything like this often doesn't work. To make things more complicated, in many cases you have shared accounts with IMAP where a particular email address is monitored by multiple users in an organization, making again things like uh, difficult to guess, unique passwords, more difficult to manage. Now, when you look at it initially, actually, it doesn't look that terribly successful. Proofpoint says that 1% of the attacks are successful, but if you think about that one out of 100 account email accounts in your company is possibly compromised, that of course uh, gives you a quite high likelihood to have a compromised account because, well, uh, many organizations have more than 100 email accounts. Now, overall, they found that 70% of cloud tenants in the cloud uh, uh, environments that they looked at were at least targeted by these uh, threat actors. And in 40% of the tenants' cases, they were successful to compromise at least one account. Now, once they get access to one of these internal accounts, they often use it then to breach additional accounts by, for example, sending more targeted uh, phishing emails using this internal account that is uh, then often trusted or at least more likely to be trusted than a random account sending a phishing email. Other tricks, of course, resulted in the usual business email compromise. They also then add forwarding rules so they receive any copies for any emails sent to this account. As far as the brute forcing goes, they often use large botnets in order to do the password for brute forcing, making it a little bit more difficult to actually defend and detect uh, these attacks. In some cases, and I think I mentioned a couple of attacks like this uh, recently, a uh, proof point also noted that once they have access to this uh, one account, they not only use it to send uh, phishing emails internally, but also to trusted or organizations that then also are being hit with phishing emails, hoping that because of the pre-established trust relationship between uh, the email account and that other organization, the victim is more likely to fall for the phishing attack. Now I'm talking about two-factor authentication. Uh, Google gives its G Suite users a bit more granularity in actually configuring two-factor authentication. Two methods of two-factor authentication, SMS and voice calls, have sort of gotten a lot of criticism, like with, for example, NIST stating that SMS should not be used for two-factor authentication. So G Suite now allows administrators to specifically disable these forms of 
two-factor authentication and instead it's pushing its security keys. Sounds like a good move in particular since they do leave it up to the user to really decide if they do want SMS or they do want to allow SMS and voice calls or not. There may certainly be a number of scenarios where you do want to retain the ability to use a fairly simple and cheap second factor like SMS. An interesting blog post by Denis Ansakovich about how to extract BitLocker keys from TPM. Now, this is not a straightforward exploit and essentially requires hooking up a logic analyzer to the TPM chip and observing the data being transmitted to and from the chip. In addition, this only really works with TPM 1.2, not TPM 2.0, but by default, you'll usually see only TPM 1.2 enabled. If you are worried about an attack like this, that again requires someone actually getting a hold of your system, opening it up and hooking up the logic analyzer, protecting yourself with a pin should mitigate the attack. Or if you have any secondary form of authentication, like a USB stick or something like that, that should also help you mitigate this attack. But remember, the reason you do have full disk encryption and store keys in TPM is just because you are afraid of someone may get physical access to your system. So it is a valid attack, even though probably not an attack that you will see applied every day. And just a little bit about this month's contest. So where am I located uh, this week? I decided to sort of give some progressive hints uh, throughout the week. At this point, nobody has really gotten all that close to my location. So just what I want to say is right now it's 9.30 p.m. where I'm at as I'm recording this and I'll probably move this podcast live within the next half hour or so. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.